crisis in Iraq. Analysis of the Iraq war requires more time than can be given here. But suffice it to say, whereas the decision-making process served Bush reasonably well in the immediate aftermath of September 11th and during the early part of the war in Afghanistan, the deliberations, unfortunately, that led up to the war in Iraq were another matter. So too were Bush's inclinations and style as a decision maker, as well as the mindsets, if not the machinations, of key principles such as Cheney and Rumsfeld. The end result was that much of the case for war, as we now know, proved to be based on faulty evidence. As well, the post-war reconstruction of Iraq was poorly planned and executed. Although a free, democratic, and politically stable Iraq may yet emerge, few major decisions made by a modern president were so defective in terms of process. There were a number of sources of problems. Yet President Bush's own words are revealing. I trust people, Bush tells us. Yet one repository of that trust, the formal structure of decision making, was not permeable enough so that dissenting views and dissonant information percolated upward. This may not have been a problem early in the administration when the policy agenda was driven by key campaign proposals. But in the more complex case of war with Iraq, difficulties were surely there. Errors, faulty inferences, misplaced assumptions, and public exaggerations ranged across the administration's case for war. So too with post-war Iraq. To take but one example, and there are indeed many, the crucial decision to, 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 to disband the Iraqi army. The latter is still the subject of some controversy. And it remains unclear who was the final authority issuing that order. Yet some reports indicated that Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and even President Bush learned of it only after it had been made. My friends, this is surely an impressive roster of the uninformed. I am an accessible person, Bush tells us. And as James Risen notes in his book, State of War, quote, if someone had spoken up clearly and forcefully, the entire house of cards might have collapsed. A little bit of digging might have revealed the truth, end quote. I listen, Bush tells us. Yet while he might have asked questions at times, President Bush did not engage his principles on the most fundamental of questions. As Bob Woodward relates, he never directly asked Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld whether he recommended going to war against Iraq. Nor had Bush asked Secretary of State Powell or even Vice President Cheney Quote, well, these are Bush's words, I could tell what they thought. I did not need to ask, end quote. Nor did Bush heed the advice of a number in the military and other professionals who thought that too few troops were being committed to the effort. I trust the advisors I get, Bush tells us. Yet during deliberations on war with Iraq, NSC advisor Rice now failed to act as an honest broker as she had done during Afghanistan. In fact, the case for war against Iraq might have been a closed issue for her. I am firm with people, Bush tells us. Yet part of Rice's difficulty <clears throat> was a failure of cooperation from defense and particularly Donald Rumsfeld. The interagency vetting process became broken as a result. 
especially with respect to planning for and executing Iraq's post-war stability and reconstruction, intramural disputes broke out. Yet Bush was unwilling to bring order and discipline to the process, to ride herd on some of his key principles, or to reach out for alternative sources of counsel. I am a decider, Bush tells us. But what was the quality of the information and advice at the foundation of those decisions? Internal time, re-election. Bush was able to elude <coughs> his father's electoral fate <coughs> and somewhat narrowly achieve re-election. The campaign skills of the Bush team, especially those of Karl Rove, were able to make the election as much about John Kerry and his record as that of the administration's. Yet campaign skills are not the same as governing skills. The campaign did not successfully lay the groundwork for the domestic priorities of a Bush second term. Internal time, a second transition. In the aftermath of the 2000 election, many of the major White House players remained in place. Card, Communications Chief Dan Bartlett, who had replaced Karen Hughes in 2002, OMB Director Josh Bolton, and of course, Karl Rove. Indeed, Rove's responsibilities markedly increased as he was now given greater control over policy development. The role of the White House staff in the second term promised continuity, but was an opportunity mit, missed to inject fresh blood into the mix and perhaps shake things up a bit, especially in enlisting a counterweight to Rove's political calculus. Was there, again to return to Bush's words, too much trust? The cabinet at the start of the second term was also more conservative than the first. As Shirley Ann Warshaw notes, this may have led, quote, to a narrower focus in the decision-making structure, end quote. Coupled with the three former staff members who were now in the cabinet, these conservatives and loyalists, according to Warshaw, quote, reduced the number of differing opinions in the policy-making process. Also notable is who was kept on. Rumsfeld, the most controversial of cabinet members, continued as Secretary of Defense until the midterm elections of 2006. And it may have been another missed opportunity for change. One wonders what the administration's strategies and fortune in Iraq might have been had Rumsfeld been replaced two years earlier. Internal time a lame duck second term. As a chief executive and decision maker known for delegation and for promotion from within, Bush increasingly relied upon a more parochial team. Those who had some experience increasingly drew it from service within the limited confines of this presidency. Unlike at the start when many of their elders had broken their political and administrative teeth working for the president's father or even Ronald Reagan. Subsequent reports of internal debates, especially within the White House staff, suggested insularity, a lack of reality testing, and a Bush bubble. There were also problems over time in the president's abilities as a decision maker and as a manager. The victories of the early first term developed from a coherent strategy derived from a few key election themes. But as new challenges emerged, the old approach seemed shopworn. Interestingly, there was no mention of adaptation or of learning behavior in the Bush operational code with which we began. 